Well, hello there. I hope you've come from one of my other videos feeding into this one, or at least that you've seen one of the previous videos to this one, because we have a lot to discuss related to saturated fat, unsaturated fat, and your muscle health. Is one fat worse for you? And if so, what are the mechanisms? Also, what could be done to avoid these issues? Well, across multiple videos, not including the deep dive analyses, we've been covering several studies from a couple of research groups investigating the effect the two major fat types, saturated versus unsaturated, have on the mitochondrial function and insulin sensitivity in muscle cells. It seems that, according to the data that we covered, saturated fat was, well, to put it mildly, less than ideal for mitochondrial health as well as insulin sensitivity. Since the mitochondrial function is highly related to various diseases like cancer, dementia, diabetes, and insulin sensitivity is highly related to diabetes, it's worrisome to see saturated fat have such negative effects on both, creating mitochondrial dysfunction and insulin insensitivity, which are both hallmarks of disease. Now, I'd like to bring up some of the mechanisms for why saturated fats have these negative effects based on the research that we covered. I shied away from presenting this information in the previous videos because, well, I try not to overwhelm you with molecular biology in one video, and they were already heavy enough. So let's discuss them here a bit because they'll offer us some clues into some preventative measures. There were two main mechanisms. First, oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is largely generated by the mitochondria, and it can be overwhelming when the mitochondria produces substantial amount of these damaging molecules known as reactive oxygen species, abbreviated ROS. Saturated fat seems to increase the amount of oxidative stress. So we covered that before, but what does the ROS do? Well, according to the research, it changes the internal signaling of the muscle cells. How? It activates a protein known as JNK. It's always fun saying that name because if you say it as one word, it kind of sounds like junk. Uh, but anyway, the phosphorylation, also known as the activation of JNK, is known to be an internal signal in the cells as a stress signal because JNK is believed to be a stress enzyme. Activated JNK reduces the activation of insulin signaling proteins like IRS, which are important for insulin sensitivity. Beyond that, oxidative stress also physically damages the DNA, the genes within the mitochondria. As such, if these genes are read for the formation of key components of the mitochondrion, they will be mutated and generate less functional or non-functional proteins to be used in the mitochondria. That can be disastrous as these mitochondria will eventually succumb to their injuries and die off. As a last point on this first mechanism, encouraging the repair of mitochondria and reducing the activity of the stress enzyme JNK recovers insulin sensitivity in the muscle cells. So we'll revisit that later because it offers us a clue. The second mechanism revolves around ceramides. If you're scratching your head, don't worry. I wasn't too familiar with them either, but I wised up and now you will be as well. Let's back up a few steps. Fats come in two primary forms that we've discussed, saturated or unsaturated. And there are subclasses beneath of those, but those are the nutritional fat molecules. So you normally consume a food containing a lot of saturated fat molecules or unsaturated fat molecules if it contains fat. Once those fats enter the cells of your body, they can be manipulated by your cells through a variety of enzymatic reactions, meaning proteins with particular functions within will cut away and add to the base structure of the fat. In this instance, saturated fat. So saturated fat enters your muscle cells and there an enzyme, a protein called ceramide synthase will make modifications to that saturated fat and convert it to, you guessed it, a ceramide. Now, a ceramide is a fat that combines a saturated fat molecule with a sphingosine molecule. Don't worry about knowing that. Just know that the shape of the saturated fat has been changed as it has been anchored to another molecule. 
Now, the issue with that is an overaccumulation of ceramides in the muscle cell leads to ceramides physically anchoring to key signaling proteins within the cell, inhibiting their normal interactions with other downstream proteins. So a great example of that is the insulin signaling within the cell. It will block the interaction of these proteins like IRS, AKT, and others that are necessary to tell the cell to suck up sugar, glucose, from the surrounding environment, thereby keeping blood sugar high, a hallmark of insulin resistance. Okay, so I didn't report this in the other videos, but these same studies also showed better muscle cell health when inhibiting the generation of ceramides within the cells when exposed to saturated fats. So this would imply that saturated fats led to greater ceramide production, but more experiments would need to be done. So we wouldn't be able to base it solely off of these results. All right, that leaves us with an understanding of the main mechanisms detailed, although surely there are more. So this is all interesting, but assuming we accept all this data as fact, what can we do about it? Well, allow me to throw a few cautions your way. First, these studies were done in isolated cells. And while I have zero issues with that fact, because it offers certain advantages, it also has some disadvantages, like the applicability to a person as a whole, which we'll get to, or the relative amount of fat added can be substantially higher than that which you might find in the body. But at concentrations of 100 micromolar to 1 millimolar in these studies were still relatively normal levels to what you would find in the body. But the translation may not be exact. Considering this holds true in other studies, however, which is still a big if at this point as we delve deeper, what can we do with this information? Well, we've seen that saturated fats, at least palmitate or palmitic acid, is not advised for muscle cell health as measured by mitochondrial function and insulin sensitivity. However, the same was not true when consuming unsaturated fat, as we know that the effects are not universal to all fats. So they just seem specific to saturated based on these studies alone. Fascinatingly, the combination of both fat types also eliminated the negative effects of saturated fats. So what does that tell us? It tells us that if we expose muscle cells to saturated fat alone, we may reap the consequences. But if we expose a more balanced fat profile that also contains unsaturated fats, the cells may be protected from these effects. So to be safe, erring on the side of unsaturated fats primarily or completely based on unsaturated fats would be the best bet in these outcome measures. But this is all based on cell data, which is a leap to immediately attribute to a complete human, right? So let's assume you don't believe everything that I've presented to you here. You want further proof, especially in human beings, not cells. Well, you're in luck because the next piece of content shows data in humans and the results are intriguing, especially since some other mechanisms are also being explored. So that said, I'll speak to you there. Bye.